All right, welcome, welcome back. Um, we uh, we're, re we're responding to a viewer from the uh, all the way back at video number twelve today, so that should be interesting. I went and listened to part of it. It's only a ten minute video, and uh, I could see the need. Those were the days before we had video, uh, sorry, images in here. We hadn't figured out how to do quick. <coughs> <coughs> I think it's called QuickTime Player, and to incorporate videos and images. We have a couple other ways too, but I'm not as comfortable with them yet. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Guess I better start with my coffee. Mm. But before we start, yeah, but I was gonna say, and, I, and I'd rather see that maybe the need to have a couple images that that's what she referred to, so. But, um, Lovely week of uh, contributions. Thank you, uh, Benjamin C., Stephen J., Keith H., that's a nice one, very nice, William P., uh, and Linda Jen. Thanks very much. Greatly appreciated. So let's, uh, let's visit uh, Janet's comment. In, number, in video number 12, you mentioned a suggestion by Mr. Producer to put side by side two paintings done in the different ways. Now, it's me laying out that thing, the painting's done in different ways. So, outlines of objects sort of put together on the page and, and handled one at a time is my, is my crude version of an academic approach to painting. Uh, or you could even maybe say the academic approach, at least to imaginative painting, but I think even to, if you look at, uh, well, there's a lot of different people you could look at. Holbein would be a nice example, or... Um, Right of Derby, there's a number of those guys who look like they were piecing it together and not painting holistically, like in an Impressionist way. Those are the two ways, though. This, you might say the academic and the uh, Impressionist ways. And uh, what I want to make really clear when you start looking at this is that what the difference is, is that the Impressionist is looking at, <clears throat> and, and, and the way I'm talking about it now, by the way, a Boston School type Impressionist, post Monet type impressionists, but even including Velasquez type impressionists, they're heading toward, if they're not actually painting the spots and the relationships of spots, as it were, in the abstract, with the idea of getting from there to the look of nature. The imaginative painter is clearly drawing each object to look like nature itself and uh, has that unity of the general impression as an idea, but not as the driving motivation. Shall we just say it that way? There's no way in the world that a painter like Degas isn't looking to get harmony at the end, and all other painters, but the Impressionist painting from life is looking to, main, to, 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 to grasp the harmony of the whole as quickly as possible, and then move through from that, those larger statements of the big field down into more and more fine articulation, not one object at a time. Uh, you follow me? but rather one phase at a time, more broad and generic, not generic is a bad word, but, but about the whole, referencing the whole and the grand unity of it and distributing, like to get the color scheme. And then eventually breaking it down and trying to maintain and improve the color scheme as you, as you subdivide color play. Uh, now that's a simplistic way. It's, there's no great way for me to verbalize it, but these images should get you there. But that's what I mean, those two ways. I was wondering if you could do this. <laughs> so here I am doing it. Perhaps it's impossible for your soul to do an outline painting ever again. That isn't true, actually. <laughs> so I'm not here denouncing that. But when I talk about best practices, the best practices are about painting the scenario in front of you, painting that, that window in front of you. That's best practices. If I'm doing an imaginative painting, that probably isn't best practices because I have nothing up there in front of me. <laughs> so, I mean, I conceivably, if I were a Poussin, you know, could set myself up a little manic, bunch of mannequins and a little diorama and hit the notes in an impressionist way from a thing like that. It's probably true. I mean, in other words, I could create, like I do a still life, a unity, <clears throat> and then try to copy it. But no, I don't take anything away from those guys. Those are crucial to guys painting from the imagination. So... Uh, I mean, in fact, I'm working on some right now. And one of these days I'll put them up for you, you all to, to make your judgments about. But I have a number, as I have for some long time, of works that are on the imaginative side. 
So do you understand the difference? Okay. But <laughs> so <laughs> my soul is okay. <laughs> But but I did because I knew the difference uh, between an imaginative painting and a, and a painting and the visual impression in front of you. But I'm just hoping you might show us the different results. Now this is going to be more difficult than I want to admit. But the first one should be straightforwardly easy. This is this is uh, Ang, and every little tiny thing has been painted on this thing. He's been drawn around everything, and the and the Boston School titular head, I guess you could say, um, Edmund Tarbell, is is painting the visual impression, a chiaroscuro management, without this finesse and search for every little outline of every little detail, because he's working from the majors to the minors, from the power impression, from the power elements of the impression, down to the point where he realizes that he's already won, he's already got his likeness, and he's already got his, uh, his, his composition, and the beauty of the, of the day, and all that sort of thing. And at some point, he finds he's reached a point of diminishing returns. But you'll see something more in the Ang model, which is, it's not about noodling all the little teensy, teensy things, but it's more and more fine qualities in the management even of just the form of a finger. And uh, so how would, you, how would you want to describe that? But visually, without talking, and that's really where I wish for people to go, just look at pictures, okay? And you'll see the difference. You can just plainly see the difference. Now, this, this is an extreme one, but I'm saying to you that chiaroscuro pictures, like what you see with Velasquez, these things are made to order for our way of painting. They're not made to order for the guy who wants to draw outlines because it's very difficult to get outline stuff down into the weakness it, it deserves. Chiaroscuro, clear and obscure, you know, that whole thing about lost and found is very, very related to clear and obscure. So I, I better get going here. I promised Mr. Producer I'd try to do a quicker one. The one this is coming from, uh, video number 12, was I think 10 minutes long at the most. So so here's here's the early Velasquez, the what they call the Bodegones, the kitchen pictures. And here you can see that noodling, every little turn in this vase, perfectly noodled up. And so it is right through the entire painting. In fact, you can see how he's thinking by looking at this one here. He's painting the outline of an object. So, <clears throat> And he's articulating just like we would in our academic mode, the shadow line, right? The shadow line, right? right very carefully articulate the shadow line. But he's drawing all the shapes, even in the shadows, even those that might be lost. I suspect you'll find there's not a single one that he hasn't, but I haven't looked at it that close. <laughs> On the other hand, over here, look at these fingers. This is just a great example of, of painting the illusion, painting the, painting from the, the, the spot, the value, and the leading edge, that sort of model. Now, this is a section of a painting. I'm not showing you the rest of it because some parts of it are actually painted much more like this. And I find that painting difficult, except that in one way, this, because it's in the, more in the background, would appear to be more justifiable, much like the lesser finish of something like this would appear to be more justifiable, something well out of the center. But still, it denotes two different ways of working and thinking. And, um, and so this, you can see this is much more effect-based than this stuff here. This is much more object-based. Anyway, I don't want to keep talking. You can plainly see it, can't you? Even in Velasquez, the, uh, the, 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 the um, first impressionist, I guess you would say, uh, and what he's doing. But here you are, two very good examples, side by sides, of the two different ways of working, uh, the two different results. If you work from the visual impression, this guy's, again, concerned about the light as much as he's concerned about anything. In this picture here, every single thing is a, is a fully full-blown realist object, just like in that Ang one that I just showed two seconds ago. Just like this, ex exactly the same modality. And look, and again, so you see this, uh, there's a something Jerome is reaching for here in the Impressionist as well. That has more to do with the impression and how it handles... Uh, the beauty of what, it, what, what, what the phenomena is doing to your eyes, right? Are, I should say, doing to your eyes. So, uh, but see it with your own eyes. You see, that's the difference. There's two different guys. This is the earlier, well, this is the topers, I believe it's called, and this is the spinners. Now, here's Jerome, and you can see the outline base. This whole out figure would have drawn, the whole, all the drapery was drawn beforehand and all that sort of thing. 
And in this picture where he's laying in the figure right now, you can see all the lines for the architecture that are going to go into the background of this. I don't know if he had someone doing that for him, laying that in for him. I know that Barg worked for him and may have been doing that. I understand that Barg was actually a cripple, and, and uh, that's, I don't know what, as a thing what that is, but, it, but I understand that that being, that Jerome uh, using him in that way was undoubtedly a real serious benefit. But that's, uh, yeah, that, that puts him down, and I don't mean to do that. Uh, Barg is, is wonderful in his own right. And in, in my view, there's, except there's a few of his that aren't, that really seem to rise every bit as high as, as Jerome and some higher. <clears throat> Thinking of the Turkish Sentinel, if you haven't seen that one. But this is the end result. As you can see it again, even the, even the weak players out here are, are drawn like a cast drawing carefully around everything. So you'll see that even in where the lines are, are less loose, more loose, whatever, and the thing isn't as square edged, carefully made that way. You can see that every object, every unit out there of, of things is fully formed in a, in a, in a um, different way, shall we say, from the, from the one on the right. So just use your eyes. Keep using your eyes. Now, here's, here's an interesting conundrum <clears throat> because at, on his most beautiful days, this guy is, is, is the most magical academic of them all. And I don't really mean academic, I mean just he's a great handler of human form in the great traditions of the West. And uh, this magnificent articulation of the great forms and the minor forms uh, gives way from time to time to messes like this that look totally impressionistic. Even the handling of this is very impressionistic. You can see he's not going down here and carefully noodling around everything. He's more inclined to do it in the fingers in significant part. But you go to spots like this, and even the handling of this stuff back here, you start seeing something that's got a different look to it. So if you take my way of looking at these, I see two different painters at work at this phase in his career. Man, one of them is this guy that just likes the blob. He sort of memorized the general look of something, and he blobs it on there. But he doesn't have this, what would you call it, the conscience of an academic? He doesn't want to go around and draw every little thing. What? So is that the influence of impression? the word impression and painting the impression. Uh, again, I'm just, notice I'm, if you can't see the differences in these works, now this isn't noodled up, but it will be like this. And then there are spots like this and other places, they're just purely impressionistic. I don't know what other way to say it. By the way, I like both Millet and Gamel repeating it, or maybe repeating it, that we're all, Manet, I'm sorry, said it, but uh, that, all, actually, all painters are impressionists, right? Of one kind or another, on one level or another. So um, now here's a, an example, though, and what I'm going to walk you into is is how I work. And it's this, I've, I took from what you said at the beginning that the side by side model might be useful of my work, and I realized it really probably wasn't what you meant. But I'm going to show you. So this is the lay in of a tarbell, a figure, right? And you can see it's not carefully outlined and being noodled, you know, figure first. And yet he can get to the same kinds of finish if he liked, to whatever degree he likes. And I don't have any ability to pull this forward at this point, or I would, but, um, and drag you right into looking at this. But this way of working doesn't mean the end result is all that different necessarily. But these guys are doing certain other things, putting down a stroke and leaving it and that sort of thing isn't necessary to a visual impression. But it is necessary to certain aspects of the way they, <clears throat> of getting the stuff that drives them. <clears throat> but I'm just simply saying to you that if you start like this, you don't have to, you can still end as articulately as you like. Uh, this is a start, a, just a different start. But the look of this versus that, well, that's probably not the best one to look at. Here again, here's a start. This, I'm, this is still Tarbell. And this is something, so you might say he started this way, vague, l large masses big blasts of light, major forms. And there's significant areas where he may never go into those areas at all and work. No conscience of an academic, not at all. And then there are other places where he's, you can see though that he can make this area as refined as he wants, as, as finessed as he wants to. This picture actually isn't, uh, isn't giving, doing justice. This is quite a sweet picture. It's, I mean, it's nice here too, but all right, and then this is Starbill again, showing you like these stages. So here's a significantly more worked up, beautiful, beautiful hand in the Angian 
uh, uh, you might even say uh, in Degas manner. And here's a Velasquez handled area. But so each of these has, well, they have similarities because obviously he isn't going off and becoming an academic. So it does, it does, it, it still stops short of being, you know, look, you can find all the objects in here. It does stop short of that. But this one stops, I guess you could say, far short of that. And you can, this is where the, you can see the temptation comes to have you produce something like this has got so much magic. It's fully expressing the story. And the dance of the light is well handled. I mean, everything that matters in terms of the general impression, again, again, the unity of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the unit, the, the, well, what should we say? The unity of that which turned you on, that got you excited about this one. He's already there. That sort of characteristics. I'm talking words now, but again, we got to go. Let's just go back and just keep looking at the academics. You see the difference on the right. There's a difference in result. Now, I'm going to show you further, though. So if I go here to Paxton, the difference is really noticeable. Paxton's got the conscience of Aang. He's noodled every little teeny thing virtually. He's just slightly short of it, probably because he's hanging around these guys. But you can see the very fine modeling of every little thing about this. this is a very much what I would call an academic exercise. And uh, and 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 it, you know I won't get into what we've talked about Paxton in relation to Gamble and that thought. I will say that I believe the strength of Gamble's teaching has come through the generation after as academic. And uh, the Boston School thing uh, far less far less so. But lots of people who have studied with Lack and other people, Richard Lack and other people, have come away st still wanting this and are searching it out. This is Benson. And again, you can see just in the last one I showed you the tarbell on the left, you can see what he's doing here is he's managing the effects because that's what's dancing. This thing is magical. It's got a little bit of a mood, a little bit of a story and all that sort of stuff. But the, but, the, but the beauty of the light, the magic of the color play, the spotting, is, this, is, this is the Impressionist vision. It's what he strives for. It's not, it's not the realist. It's not the realist model. It's not the academics model. <clears throat> I thought of some interesting comments. Anagoni, I was looking up Anagoni. He did had his manifesto about, about the new realists. And I thought he meant this kind of painting like Paxton on the left. And he's a very, very beautiful draftsman. Anagoni, I would take nothing away from his, 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 the portrait of standing Queen Elizabeth is about as beautiful as anything in a century or so. But, um, but his realism is the all the warts sort of armory show kind of real, not armory show, Ashcan school, sort of socialist realism. And that's not, the, that doesn't have the same uh, 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 meaning as this idea of the representational level that sometimes today has become to mean realism. So now let me just give you a couple examples of mine. I'm pushing this already, I'm, I'm Mr. Producer. Hang on there. <laughs> um, so these two, I, these, these two I did copies of. And in both cases, now in the case this is a Paxton, and you know it's noodled up in that way, so virtually everything is on here is noodled up, frame noodled everything noodled up. But I laid it in as I would have laid in a, a Benson if I was copying a Benson, or the way I lay in my own pictures, which I've showed you before. I, but you can see both of these pictures, they wind up in slightly different places. This is John White Alexander. And you can see he's got a considerable, considerably greater amount of lostness. So there again, I would just say to you, those are side by sides. These aren't enormously clear differences, but they are, um, but they're side by sides. Now, so what I am saying, if you see the start by Tarbell, it's relatively like a lost and found. It really, it's it's different from from the Boston School willingness to lose drawing. And um, uh, nevertheless, it gets you an idea though that however you lay in a painting, the more loosely without careful outline drawing at the beginning that you can bring it to whatever level of articulation you like. And I'm trying to show you that in my own work. Now, these are things you've seen before, but I'm just going to use it as an example. But this is where you can, you'd be hard pressed to know which one I did what way, right? This is a pastel done in the visual order. <laughs> this is a painting done academically before I fully grasped how to play this game. And uh, so you can see that at the end of the day, I'm looking for certain results that are fairly similar, right? What I consider to be the huge advantage of painting the Impressionist way is that you can get all the color life. 
and it's a and it's a visually important thing to do. Uh, what shall we say? It's a it's an aesthetically important thing to do if you love color. So um, so here again the same thing academic over here, and this is a more recent painting that's been laid in entirely from lost and found in big major masses and and et cetera et cetera. It was never at any point a careful outline, a, a drawing of any kind. And then here on the far left, as I've shown you before, is a careful drawing that we would have done with Gamel, outlining every object, and then we would trace all these objects onto the canvas, which is exactly this size. We were doing this to order, right? We we're making this perfectly sized to a particular, you know, which we stretched. We, we did this drawing, and then we figured out exactly how big to make the frame, and then traced this drawing on the frame. As Gamma would say, so we don't lose the drawing, we traced it on. on t we used, um, we used um, tracing paper and put charcoal on the back. We uh, pounced sometimes, we traced and then pounced and then made charcoal go through and make dots. And sometimes we used even uh, graphite paper, which you just um, uh, place below the transparent paper around the canvas and then you trace your lines and uh, I used to find that I had so many drawing problems in these things that I began to trace fewer and fewer of the lines. And then I would begin working from those places where I knew it was something for sure. But now, now, in both cases here, these are paintings done from uh, the spot, mass, the mass drawings, visual order, impressionist, color first draw, painting. So I'm talking now, but the difference isn't huge in the end for, for these two. But maybe you'll find that it is more so with these two. So this is very early on, uh, what I call my, 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 my graduation piece from, from academic painting. And this is a, a recent picture of a couple years ago. And I think what you will see about these, well, what I can see about these is the management of the, of the color and all that stuff in the abstract that gives you a considerably greater sense of atmosphere. Now, just getting the right color values in all the right places gives you a lot of it. But the idea of, uh, of not painting areas, of losing things and lost and found stuff, you know, creating areas like this really more efficiently because you're not concerned as an academic might be about finding the edge of things. Uh, you may have a couple advantages there. Still, that's lost and found, clear obscure, um, the um, fog, all those things are factors, but so is the... In, in, in factors in getting uh, uh, atmosphere, but so is color in the shadows. So we, let's just see if there's anything, uh, just if you look at these. So what I'm saying to you is that I don't know where the academic advantage is, but when I was trying to figure out how to paint, I, wasn't, I wanted to be able to do any kind of painting I felt like. So these guys here, this is, not, this is a copy of a sergeant. I almost forgot I was going to show you, the, you these things. The, this is a copy of a sergeant. And let's see if I can get these up there so you can see them plainly. And the other one is a, um, is a uh, study of a little geisha doll that the Japanese uh, people like to leave you if they've been guests in your house. I don't know where the focus is best. It probably is better back here somewhere. Uh, but you can see these are visual orderly painted, right? You can see I've, pa I've not drawn objects. I've drawn the entire mass. Well, I'm going to talk about this one. In this, I'm sorry, but not about this one, but the sergeant one, I've, I, this is just a copy for the purposes of finding out if my visual order way of working was also a sergeant's. And of course, I found that it was, it was, it must, it was virtually exactly what he was doing. I, I've never studied sergeant in that way. I've never made any attempt to copy a sergeant. But this, this, this here is a nice example, though, of what we mean, we get all over the place. We have all the color going all over the place and we have the leading drawing in various places all going to work at the same time as we're doing all the other stuff. So color spots everywhere and a lot of white canvas as you're getting points like this and points like this and certain other placements to get you top and bottom, left and right. But that, this is what leads to what you're looking at right here on the screen here. There's no difference, uh, but this is pushed a little bit, but you've seen all my starts. So. But this is a, an example of where you might leave a painting if you work it this way. You're not obliged to push it to representational painting. But I didn't want to have to work two different ways for one thing, and I wanted more efficiencies than I could get. I found I could get to the truth of my relationships faster in this way than, than, uh, than in this, you know, in this uh, 
uh, gamma outline tracing way. So I think that's, you know, the side-by-sides thing is a pretty huge thing. So I'm going to go right back to the originals. These are side-by-sides, the old academic outline of objects, and the impressionist uh, uh, view of the field as a whole. Uh, has they, well, I'm not going to say more. They, maybe this is the ultimate. Huh? All right, Janet, I hope that helps. Oh, rats, uh, more, almost to 30 minutes already. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Producer. Oh, hope your work week goes well. This isn't too much of a killer for you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, let me know if there's something else I can add to this thought. Uh, but think for yourself. The most fundamental thing I can tell you to do is use your eyes. Not, don't listen to what people tell you. Use your eyes. You can see what's going on. You can see there's a different result. The comprehensive atmospheric qualities in this, in this tarbell are not possible the other way. You can, you can approximate it, but there are things that prevent it. And it's, this reminds me a whole lot about how, how opposed uh, Ang was to the idea that great drawing and great color can be in the same picture. So you might argue that that kind of drawing, the outline of objects kind of drawing, and he's referring to his own drawing, and the, and the um, visual impression of the light and the, and the play of light, uh, the dance of light and atmosphere require different approaches. And in any case, here they are, the look. All right. Get back to me, Janet. All right. All right, I wish you all well. Thank you again very much for your donations, guys. This week, that's been nice. And um, I think, by the way, that's been over a couple of weeks, so I don't mean to... I didn't get the back. I think Mr. Producer was out of town. So if we can just uh, keep on sharing, liking, and um, make, sending your comments in this, we'll go fine. We'll keep going. Uh, I haven't been seeing as many comments, and I think it's probably because I'm not in the right locations lately, uh, so I'm going to have to figure out talking to Mr. Producer, how to get to my comment section more, you know, in a better way. All right, I'm taking too long. Take care, Mr. Producer. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a good week.